Thanks to all of you for, for inviting me. This is a uh, really impressive project, and I have nowhere to put my paper. Um, so Susan and I have, have divided up labor. I guess we were invited here. It's actually not clear to me why we were invited. I, 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 presumably, one person was, they, they wanted one person who knew something about, about electoral systems and, and elections, and that's Susan. Then they wanted someone who knew something about Latin American elections, which is also Susan. <laughs> so I, I think I'm just a local. But um, we decided to divide up labor uh, by paper. So I'm going to talk about the uh, Maldonado and Seligson paper and the Sarsfield paper, um, hopefully within time. To me, one of the most striking things about, about electoral fraud in Latin America actually is how little of it we've seen over the last 25 years. Arguably, there should be a lot more electoral abuse in Latin America than we actually see. Many countries in the region are governed either by weakly institutionalized democracies or by hybrid regimes. Uh, in all but a handful of countries, state institutions are pretty weak, are politicized. Uh, courts are not very independent. Bureaucracies are politicized. Corruption is pretty rampant. And yet electoral fraud has been pretty rare over the last couple of decades. There are major cases of fraud in Panama and Mexico in 1988, in the DR in 1994, contested elections in Peru in 2000, recently obviously in Venezuela. But beyond that, not very much. Peru, for example, has had several highly polarizing, high stakes elections with thin margins of victory. Uh, yet, despite the fact that the country has incredibly weak democratic institutions, we see very little fraud or abuse. Argentine governments constantly abuse power. They pack courts, they lie about inflation, they manipulate institutions in all kinds of ways, but they don't, for the most part, steal votes. There's no serious talk of electoral fraud in 30 years of Argentine democracy. In Mexico, notwithstanding the perfect storm of 2006, there has not really been any significant fraud in two decades. Even in Venezuela, where the regime is clearly authoritarian, it's not clear how much actual outright fraud there's been. So elections, I would say, have been surprisingly clean in Latin America. They've been clean even in countries with long histories of fraud, like Mexico and the DR. And they've been cl uh, clean in, in areas where in democratic institutions are really strikingly weak, like Peru and Argentina. To me, that's an outcome to be explained. Um, now, do Latin Americans agree with me that Latin, that Latin American elections are okay? Of course they don't. Uh, as, as Maldonado and Seligson point out, outside of Uruguay, the level of trust in elections in Latin America is, is pretty low. Now, that's not surprising in countries like Haiti, Honduras, Paraguay, uh, but trust in elections is also very low in Brazil, where elections are pretty good. It's pretty low in Mexico, Argentina. It's even pretty low in Costa Rica. Another outcome, I think, to be explained. I'll return to that point. Now, Maldonado and Seligson focus on the gap between winners and losers in voter perceptions of electoral integrity. They find that being a winner or loser in election is a major prediction, a predictor of trust in, in elections. They also find, not too surprisingly, that the uh, trust gap between winners and losers is mediated by democracy, so the gap is, um, is higher in hybrid regimes like Venezuela and Nicaragua than in democracies like Brazil and Chile. Uh, not that surprising, where governments systematically abuse power and violate rights. Election losers are more likely not to trust the electoral process. Think about Capriles supporters in Venezuela. Uh, and finally, Maldonado and Seligson find that alternation in power reduces the trust gap between winners and losers. So if you're a loser and the incumbent never seems to lose, you're more, much more likely to distrust elections. Think of the opposition in Mexico in the 1990s, Paraguay up until 2009. But alternation in power can change things actually pretty dramatically. Um, looking at figure three of the paper, three cases really stand out. I think these are actually worth looking at. El Salvador, Paraguay, and Peru. In El Salvador, where Arena won four consecutive elections, F I, my guess is FMLN voters uh, largely distrusted the electoral process. But after the FMLN wins for the first time in 2008, the gap just disappears. Same thing in Paraguay after the Colorado party finally loses in 2009. And in Peru, it was presumably, Arturo will know this better than me, it was presumably Umala voters in the interior who distrusted the electoral process in 2006 and then gained trust after Umala won in 2011. So it seems that perceptions about electoral fairness can change pretty quickly. All right, a couple of observations about this paper. I want to just toss out an additional variable. The, the winner-loser gap seems to be largest in countries whose polities are highly polarized. Venezuela, Nicaragua, Guyana, increasingly Argentina, and Bolivia. Uh, 
in addition to that, as the paper shows, the, the gap is also greatest in countries where democratic institutions are weak. So there may be, I think, an interesting interaction to look at between polarization and institutional strength. The biggest gap, the biggest winner-loser gap should be where you combine high polarization and weak institutions. Nicaragua, Guyana, Venezuela, maybe Bolivia. The smallest gap should be where you combine low polarization and strong institutions. Maybe Costa Rica, although the gap was actually higher than I thought, and uh, maybe Uruguay. But what about the mixed cases? This is, this is where you may see some interesting stuff. What happens when you combine high polarization and strong institutions, like say Brazil and Uruguay in the early 2000s? And what about low polarization and weak institutions, like say Honduras prior to the rise of Zelaya? Might be worth exploring. Stepping back, and I know this is well beyond the scope of the paper, how do we explain general levels of low trust in elections in Latin America? Again, to me, this is a puzzle. There have been very few stolen elections in Latin America in the last quarter century. Unlike the former Soviet Union, Africa, much of Asia, electoral turnover is high in Latin America. Incumbent parties routinely lose elections. So why don't Latin Americans trust elections? One possibility is what we're observing in the day that you show is largely a manifestation of broader public distrust in democratic institutions, as you guys have shown uh, in a handful of countries, like Uruguay, with exception, with the exception of a handful of countries, trust in democratic institutions, parties, Congress, courts, is low pretty much across the board. So is it just that? Is this just a, a manifestation of that? Or is this distrust rooted, say, in concrete historical experience? Perhaps a history, maybe a long history of fraud or abuse generates levels of distrust that are difficult to change in the short term. The paper mentions or contrasts the US election of 2000 with the Mexican election of 2006. The US election of 2000 was almost certainly more flawed than the Mexican election of 2006. God knows Mexico's electoral administration was better. The, but the fact, so the fact that Bush's election was much more quickly and widely accepted than Calderon's suggests that the past weighed very heavily on voter perceptions. So maybe it's a question of time. Maybe 25 or 30 years of elections and turnover is not enough. I don't know, but I would like to know more about why Latin Americans, for the most part, don't trust their elections. Um, all right, vote induction in Mexico. Mexico is a really weird case, at least from my perspective. Mexicans have raised the bar for electoral integrity to nearly unprecedented levels. For elections to be fair in Mexico, the major parties need to have nearly equal access to finance and media. There can be no negative campaigning. And the president can't even whisper a word of public support for his party's presidential candidate. So by Mexican standards, US presidential elections don't even come close to meeting minimal standards of integrity. Sarsfield's paper is written in this context. Rodolfo notes at the outset that, that old style fraud is largely absent now in Mexico. So his focus is on more legal or, or subtle forms of electoral manipulation, including what he calls vote induction. Now this is, a, a, I think, potentially a very useful concept, but it, it's, it's still not entirely clear to me what vote induction is. You, you defined it as a deliberate strategy by election officials or other electoral stakeholders looking for a systematic electoral decision which distorts the individual or collective will of the voters. That's, right, that's pretty vague to me. Um, who are the other electoral stakeholders? Media? Is it political parties? Can non-state actors be stakeholders? If so, if parties can be stakeholders, can opposition party electoral campaigns be characterized as vote induction? I think you need to be a little clearer here. Now, the focus of the paper is the fact that, as you just mentioned, that in 2012, most polls overestimated support for pre-candidate Enrique Peña Nieto. Rodolfo does a state-level analysis and finds that the polls were most off the mark, where the pre-governed and where dependence on federal contributions was high. This is an interesting finding, but it's not clear to me yet, anyway, that what this has to do with electoral manipulation. I, I think two things could use some clarification. First of all, again, it's pretty vague, the paper's pretty vague, about what kind of vote induction is actually going on. Uh, Rodolfo, Rodolfo writes that uh, the mechanism seems to have been an intense political and social mobilization driven by government agencies and parties. And that, together with, with local media bias, 
triggers a bandwagoning, bandwagoning effect among voters. Pressure for social conformity reinforced by mutual monitoring leads some people to lie to pollsters. I would have liked to see these mechanisms spelled out a little bit more clearly, maybe with, for, for non, particularly for non-Mexican readers, uh, a few empirical examples. What exactly are we talking about when we talk about uh, uh, manipulating entire communities or, or enforcement, mutual monitoring, threat of violence within communities? Um, but more fundamentally, it, it wasn't clear to me, it's still not clear to me, why pollsters' overestimation of the vote for Peña Nieto is necessarily an indicator of electoral manipulation. To me, it suggests actually that the secret ballot worked really well, where the, machi where the pre machine is at work, where the local pre is in power, where there was real mo vote manipulation going on. Shouldn't we see the pre vote exceed the polls rather than fall short of the polls? This is, to my knowledge, this is survey induction, but it's not vote induction. So the question is is survey induction a form? of electoral manipulation. I don't know, but I think that the paper needs to make a stronger defense of why we should treat this as a form of electoral manipulation. That said, I look back and it looks like the PRI also underperformed its national polls in 2000 and 2006. So there does seem to be some sort of interesting phenomenon here, and it would be interesting to do a state level analysis of those elections as well. I think I've gone over time. It is all yours. All right. Um, OK, great. Thanks for the invitation, Pippa, to be here. And uh, uh, thanks to the panelists for, for really excellent um, and, and very interesting papers, um, all of which I think get to the nuts and bolts of various challenges to electoral integrity. Um, I'm, uh, if it's not already obvious, going to focus on the middle two papers. Um, and first talk about uh, Andrea Shedler's paper, which I thought was a very thought-provoking uh, piece on the chilling effects of criminal violence on elections and democracy. Uh, there were also a lot of ta tantalizing references to your new book, which I went and looked up, and it's not quite out yet, I don't think. So uh, we, we also have more, more to look at there, which I'm, I'm um, eagerly awaiting. There, um, there, there's a lot, the, the paper really, the bulk, really I think the bulk of the paper is sort of excellent documentation of the current uh, civil war um, in Mexico, the magnitude, the perpetrators, the victims, um, and um, I think as it stands now, it raises what, what I have is sort of a number of suggestions about things um, that you might consider adding rather than challenging what's in the paper right now, which I think is, is interesting and thought provoking. So um, a couple of questions. How, how many civil wars are, are driven partially or primarily by organized crime or have non-state actors who are, who are organized criminals participating in them? Um, which types of violent non-state actors are involved in, in these types of conflicts? Um, on a, so, so part of my, some of my questions are really of the nature of how, is, what is this a case of and how is this different from what we already know? Um, on a smaller scale, I think mob violence in U.S. cities around elections look a little bit like some of the things you described as violations to electoral integrity and democracy. Tammany Hall also came to mind. I think organized crime has been a problem for democracy in many countries, so I just wanted to see a little bit more comparative um, uh, you know, reference to 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 this um, in order to better understand the the contribution of of this paper. Um, I think also you 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 make the claim that this is not a challenge um, to the center, which seems correct. Um, that this type of organized violence is not a challenge to the center of, of the Mexican state. Uh, but taking a step back, I think any challenge to the state's monopoly on the legitimate use of force, I think, could be a challenge to the state. Right to the strength of the state or the the ability of the state to do its job. Um, so again, one of the main questions that I have is whether this the Mexican case today is fundamentally different from other what you reference as new civil wars um, that are not ideological in nature. And I'm also curious as to whether this is really new in a more in a more general sense. So how unique do you think this case is? Um, and I think that matters a lot in figuring out um, how far to take the conclusions in the paper. Um, in, in my view, the paper takes a little too long to make, or, or you know, really prioritizes making the connection, um, uh, m making the argument that this is a that there is a big problem right now in Mexico. And I would put the connection between criminal violence and elections and democracy a little bit more front and center um, before documenting the details of organized criminal violence in Mexico. So I think. Um, 
it, it sort of seemed to me that you're arguing against someone or you think that many people don't believe this is a civil war or that this is a standard of evidence you have to achieve. And so that came through very strongly. Um, but the evidence, once you present it, is so stark that I'm not sure you need to do that, right? So that, that um, I, th I think you might be able to get to the, the argument about the, the intersection between organized criminal violence and elections a little bit more quickly. Um, so the, the gist of the paper is that the, the unintended side effect of organized violent actors is that democracy is undermined and the quality of elections is undermined. Um, and you say that this is distinct from the way in which dictators work to undermine democracy and undermine elections. Um, but then when you're going through your own theory, it looks very similar, right? So I saw there's quite a bit of tension in, is this really something new or do we just have different actors committing the same types of, um, of, of problems? Okay. Um, I think I have to be pretty brief here, but I, I, have, I have a few more comments. But I, th I think that we can all agree that civil war or, or whatever you want to call it, the type of violence currently occurring in Mexico is not good for democracy or election integrity. But I think there might be a bit further to go in exploring exactly how democracy is undermined and what this is a case of. Um, this type of violence may influence, as you point out, both the process of democracy and the essence of democracy. What I found it slightly hard to wrap my head around was how this is different from the type of electoral autocracy that involves, so so one, one end of the question is, how is this different from other types of civil war and the influence of civil war on elections and democracy? And on the other end of the, sort of my, my range of questions on this issue, it's how is this different from the other types of electoral autocrats that are kind of kleptocratic, right? that use state resources for their own economic gain, which is one of the chief motivations you attribute to the organized criminals that are perpetrators behind this violence. So it's sort of, you know, I think there's a lot of options, a lot of p potential places that this case could sit. And I just, if, if I was going to push the paper further, um, I would push you to make this a lot clearer and, and sort of say what, what you think this is. Um, if the only if the goal of the paper is to say that this is a major issue in Mexico today, deserving of more attention, I think you've already done that, right? I think you can stop. But if you want to go further in developing theory, I think um, it would be useful to address some of the questions that I've raised, and I can send some more specifics to you later when I have a little bit more time. Um, on the Uge's paper, I think, on, on electoral management bodies, I think this is a, a very interesting paper to start thinking about electoral management bodies, their characteristics. Um, the salient differences between them and why they might have more or less electoral integrity. Um, I have a few suggestions uh, aimed, I guess, at the fact that the paper as it stands right now is pretty descriptive um, and, and seeking to push you a little bit further into, into developing your own um, explanation and theory. So if you don't want to do that, then you can ignore my suggestions, but that's what I, what I have for you. Um, first of all, I consider a bit of a different framing. So rather than the three competing explanations, um, given the evidence that you've had, I've, I think I'd focus on some empirical puzzles within the cases that you have. So why are things sort of puzzling in terms of how electoral management bodies have contributed to the quality of elections in the four countries that you've looked at? Um, I also have a question about the focus on um, uh, performance of electoral management bodies as institutional autonomy and impartiality. So what seems to be missing for me is efficacy or technical capacity or their ability to administer the elections in a competent manner. Um, and I wondered if that's something that you can bring into this paper as well. Um, or make clear why you're not focusing on those things and focusing exclusively on autonomy and impartiality. On the coding of the electoral management bodies, it seems like you've done a fair bit of work here, but it's all kind of in the third person, and it's not clear what exactly you did and what, um, you know, what potential challenges to the coding could be. So one of my main questions was sort of about the coding, but can any electoral management bodies get away with violations with greater skill such that they wouldn't be captured by your coding scheme, right? Are there some electoral management bodies that are basically more proficient at not doing their job very well, but also not doing it in a way that wouldn't lead you to notice um, as a coder? Um, in other words, could the coding be systematically biased or systematically missing some information? Um, as, a, as a side note, um, some people argue that, that multi-party electoral management bodies can be impartial if there are appropriate checks and balances um, built into the, to the EMB. And so I'm not sure that this is the case in any of the four countries that you examine, but it's certainly a theoretical option that might be worth addressing. Um, on 
on the politicized, so there's the, the three hypotheses to, for, to recall for everyone, and on the one about um, the politi politicization of, of EMBs, um, I, I, there's also the, the Mexican case came to mind because it seems as though, although they may be appointed through a relatively technocratic process, I've heard from various people just in casual conversation that that has become a launching point for people's political careers and so that it's become inadvertently politicized in this other way. So I wonder if that might be something um, to also consider. Uh, on sort of thinking of methods, um, four cases and three hypotheses is kind of tough, um, particularly if the hypotheses are probabilistic. Right, so if, if some of these things makes something more or less likely than saying that it, it doesn't match or, or doesn't, you know, with, with four cases, it's just hard to know what to conclude exactly um, with the four cases and three hypotheses. And on the hypotheses more generally, there may be a lot of selection at work. So for example, on the electoral assistance organizations, um, I think you point out that, you know, that, that their activity is not particularly well correlated with EMBs that have low levels of violations, but it's entirely possible that these organizations are getting funding and engaging in more work precisely in those places where they think that more problems are expected and that their project might be more long term, right? So that um, it might be hard to capture that temporal dimension that they're aiming for improving those places that need the most help. Um, there, I think that there are similar arguments that can be made about the other two hypotheses too, right? That um, EMBs may have been introduced in a multi-party democracy context rather than by some other authoritarian government because that democracy might have had other problems that needed to be addressed, right? So it's already a problematic case and the reason why it's being instituted by a multi-party democracy is because there were major problems in the multi-party democracy, not because the authoritarian regimes are somehow better at, at creating impartial EMBs. Um, okay, and, and um, fi finally, I guess, the, um, on, the, on the politicization again, it would be good to know not just that Guatemala had a, a better, you know, you're sort of asserting that Guatemala probably has a better election commission because it has a less politicized nomination process, um, but I wanted to know why the nomination process became more technocratic in the first place. Right, so that makes sense to me, but it's almost true by definition, given the way that you've laid out the um, the coding scheme and whatnot. So, um, I, I think the the politicization hypothesis is is a, is a little bit tricky. But um, these are all just suggestions, depending on where you go. You know, there, there's very little there's very little work on electoral management bodies in general. So I think it's really good to push forward in in this area. But you know, any first. Um, people going into a field that's not particularly well, well studied has to deal with a lot of a lot of these issues. So I'm going to stop there because I think we are splitting ten minutes and I went way over. So um, I'll, I'll I'll be quiet. Thanks, Susan, uh, and thanks, Stephen. I know that I'm the bad guy with the timing thing, but I think it really would to also to get the comments and so at some point from the from the discussions since they made the effort. And yeah, we have a bit of time, so let's try to collect if some of you have any questions or comments and from there you know we'll give some time to to the panelists all right so uh whoa <laughs> frederick please first thank you this is a very refreshing panel first thing in the morning uh <clears throat> to to andreas uh just in terms of what what's mexico a case of uh so i think in terms of the how you set this up uh as a case of Challenges to a regime that's in a phase of democratic consolidation. Fine. Uh, th I think that's how you need to frame it. I would. I would just want to bring in a case of organized crime in democratic transitions. The case of Kyrgyzstan, where organized criminal groups were were pivotal in terms of bringing down the regime. So you could actually have. Uh, organized crime being good for democratization in some cases, good in terms of the kind of measures that we would use in a lot of the cross-national work. So I just remember this because I saw a slide yesterday where Kyrgyzstan in 2005 was considered to be the first free and fair election in that country. And that election came about as a consequence of criminal organized group challenging the autocrat. So that, so that just might be an interesting reflection that you would want to ignore or then just kind of say that that wouldn't apply to the kind of cases that you're interested in, which would be more of the kind of democratic consolidation questions that Mexico faces. To Rodolfo, I'm really intrigued by this whole vote induction uh, thing. Um, uh, 
I I find it hard to understand uh, what's the difference between vote induction and campaigning and kind of democratic politics. Uh, so I would really need to push you on that. Uh, it might be relevant in the Mexican case, but how far does the concept travel? Is this a new... This might be a new interesting contribution to the typologies of manipulation or malpractice that we've been talking about. But to me, on the surface of it, again, I have a bias in terms of the cases that I study. But to me, this sounds like democracy 101. You know, they are, they're, they're, they're campaigning and they're providing public goods. That's, that's, that's what democracies are supposed to be doing and political actors in democracies. But I, was really wa- I really wanted to follow up on Steve's point about actually might this not be a case of so you have over-reporting in surveys, and that's where the pre-monitoring uh, mechanism works. So people are afraid to say anything else than they're going to vote for pre. But come election day, their secret ballot, pre is not going to find out who you voted for, and therefore you don't need to vote for pre. So you might actually have a, paper, a very interesting paper here, but that would mean that you skip the whole vote induction thing and just essentially focus on the secrecy of the ballot being fully institutionalized in Mexico, and that's why you have the discrepancy between the survey data and the actual electoral returns. So, Hi, everyone. Betilde Muñoz Pogosian from the Organization of American States. And I think it was a very interesting panel. Most all of the papers actually uh, gave us a lot of insights in terms of the work that the OIS does. Uh, but I was very intrigued on Antonio's paper on the role of EMBs and the performance of EMBs, specifically uh, linked to the role that these that organizations such as the OIS as well, I'm uh, guessing you consider others like the Carter Center and, and maybe more of a national um, uh, scope. Uh, you analyze uh, the role that they had on the performance of EMBs and I, was, uh, I would like to hear a little bit more in terms of your analysis and specifically uh, why do you conclude that it had, it had an impact in some of the performance of these EMBs in Central America and not others? And I was also very interested to hear because it can inform the, the scope and the objectives and the, the way that we do interventions as, as the Organization of American States. How did you measure impact? So if you can elaborate a little bit more on that, I would be very delighted. Finally, I know there are more hands, but for sake of time, let's get one more there. And we're tight. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. First, uh, for the Sarsfield paper on vote induction, um, you know, I too find this very intriguing, and I too find, from the normative perspective, this to be, you know, in some ways, not that different from campaigning, and especially campaigning, say, in the United States, with, you know, uh, ideological pollsters. But I imagine this has to do with the use of public polls, and so in some ways, that seems more like manipulation. Um, but it also one suggestion I imagine that there are experiments out there that present respondents with uh, poll results to see if that moves their vote intention or not. And if there are, that might be a useful thing to incorporate into your paper, um, at least to show some of the the power of this. Um, And then for the uh, Seligson and Maldonado paper, also very interesting. Um, I wonder, you know, in some ways, I I think Steve uh, hits the nail on the head with thinking about what you know, really sort of this this means. And uh, I wonder if the uh, the degree of, of voter lack of confidence, um, I wonder whether that actually has anything to do with sincere attitudes and beliefs. And it may not. It might be just a ritualistic sort of negativity, and we're sort of accustomed to speaking negatively about elections, especially the mass public. Um, but that may not matter, and so it could be just that the conversation about politics is so negative and that matters in and of itself. But I wonder if you have a position on that as far as sort of the conversation about politics as opposed to actual attitudes, if we can even think about actual attitudes. So, yeah. so let's, let's respond and if you want to, please. Okay. Okay, first I would like to say that uh, our paper deals about the trust in elections in the citizens. Uh, um, for me, the main conclusion is that trust in elections is difficult to build. Uh, for trusting citizens, we need uh, uh, interpersonal trust, we need education, we need party sympathy, political interests that are the variables at the individual level that are uh, 
significant in these models. And also we need uh, that the countries uh, were mo more democratic, we need alternation, we need t uh, time. So this is a difficult recipe for uh, building trust in elections. So for me, the main conclusion is that trust in elections is difficult to build, but it's easy to, to destroy. I mean, uh, for me, it, it, uh, in the citizens' view just need uh, one case of uh, in which election is under dub or in which election fails to just destroy all this trust in, in, in election that they can build in time. Uh, that's, that's it. Antonio? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, so, one of the, the why measure the way I uh, look at electoral assistance organizations is through the, the number of, of organizations, both international and domestic, operating within each country, and then uh, the scope of where where actually they are uh, they are working and, and contributing to the electoral process. And so I'm looking at the type of assistance they provide: technical and logistical assistance, also informational assistance, and I compare that with the you know the the performance of the EMB. You know, after the after the fact, uh, and what I, you know, what I find is that it's not so much that they are not providing the assistance, but it's more by and large what I find is that the the, the they provide they highlight the, the the irregularities or technical flaws or difficulties in in reaching remote places, providing ballots like to you know jungles in Guatemala or what whatnot. But as far as preventing actual uh, you know, malfeasance or malpractice, that's, you know, that's an area that doesn't really seem to, to be addressed by these, by these organizations. So, um, I, we can talk more in detail later, but that's the gist of it. Rolfo, you want to respond? Well, thank you for, for your very interesting question. Uh, vote indu induction is a, back and obscure concept that I am trying to include in the electoral malpractice uh, uh, research agenda. Um, uh, as Professor Levinsky says, uh, said, um, uh, maybe with this data, I am talking about survey induction and not vote induction. Um, the difference with the electoral campaign, from my point of view, is um, that in the in the context of uh, neighbor neighborhood or little communities. Um, the pressure for vote uh, to, to vote for a candidate is uh, oversight by the, by informal political actors, um, and in in some cases uh, the the threat of violence is a is a credible th threat for for voters. Uh, electoral campaigns uh, in the in the um, uh, electoral campaign is a argumentative strategy, and uh, this informal this pressure of informal uh, political actor are a, are a violence uh, argument if violence is an argument. Um, I, I think that, uh, I think that um, further research is needed and uh, I, I need to, I have some ethnographic evidence and I need to work with experimental data um, and this paper is just the, the first the stage of 
a more a longer research projects. Thank you, Andreas. Yeah, thank you. Um, I forgot to apologize for the late delivery of my paper, so it's not included in the phone book we got. Uh, but it's, I suppose it's in, on the website. Um, Susan, thanks a lot for your comments. Uh, you're right, a good part of the paper is preaching to the unconverted about the fact that there is a civil war going on. Everybody talks about war, but when I talk about civil war, uh, people get kind of uh, frightened, which they should. Um, how is this different from other civil wars? I would say what I'm trying to analyze are civil wars within democratic contexts. Huh? And what I, let's say the, the, the longer horizon is to say, if you analyze civil wars in a democratic context, the political dynamics are different, uh, the, the role of citizens is different. Um, so it, it's just something I'm trying to grasp. And I'm, I'm really, this is one of my, my, my next steps and tasks to, uh, to open the, the let's say, the, to, to comprehend the universe of cases uh, I, I insert Mexico in, uh, into. And the idea is, well, civil war democracies are uh, regimes that uh, um, we, we can describe reasonably as democracies and with levels of organized violence we can describe reasonably as civil wars, uh, criminal or political. Uh, then how, how is this different from, from other forms of, uh, let's say, authoritarian elections? I think, yes, that's part of the paper. The effects are often very similar. Uh, and even some, some types of microdynamics, especially for citizens, are very similar. Uh, citizens confront very similar moral dilemmas when they, when they face coercive, violent actors uh, they, they, they need to choose whether to, to flee, to resist, to keep silent, to cooperate, uh, to be complicit, etc. So the, the, the many similarities I find very intriguing. But I would say the basic difference is the, the, the political dynamics are very, very different. So this is not a game for electoral reform or something. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for the transition question. So let's leave it here. For those of you who wanted to make a question and you don't have the time, so please you know, feel free to, to, to approach the, the discussion. Sorry, the, the presenters. I want to thank both panelists and, and discussants, Stephen Levitsky and, and Susan Hyde, for everything. Uh, let's take a break now. Thanks.